Greetings and welcome to this latest edition of Farhan Connect Live. I am Ali Rizal Ardakoni, Executive Director of Farhan Foundation here in Los Angeles. We are a member supported, non political, non religious, not for profit organization with the sole mission to celebrate and promote Iranian art and culture for the benefit of the community at large. Thank you for joining us today from all over the world for Psychology of Iranian Cuisine, part of Farhang's Iranian Cuisine Initiative. We will be holding a Q&A with our panelists towards the end of today's talk. So be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Our first guest is Armita Hosseini. Ms. Hosseini is a registered member of the College of Psychologists of Ontario as a psychological associate. She completed her master's of education in counseling psychology from the University of Western Ontario. Her curiosity about child psychology and determination to broaden her expertise led her to complete another master's in clinical developmental psychology from York University. Throughout her 10 plus years of her clinical and research training, she has worked for publicly funded mental health agencies and hospitals, including the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and various private practices. Currently, she works with children, adolescents and adults conducting diagnostic assessments and providing psychological interventions with a wide range of social, emotional, behavioral, and learning needs and challenges. Aside from her clinical practice, Ms. Hosseini is a self-taught cook and food stylist. In her kitchen, she treats food as an art form and draws inspiration from colors, flavors, texture, art, and her fond childhood memories growing up in Tehran. We are also proud to have featured Ms. Hosseini in two episodes of Farhang Foundation's virtual cuisine series, Farhang Flavor. You may follow her on Instagram under her popular Cooking with Armita profile. Our next guest is Omid Rustai. Mr. Rustai is a psychotherapist specializing in relationship and family counseling. He attended the School of Natural Cookery in Boulder, Colorado, where he studied the art of intuitive cooking. As a culinary instructor, Mr. Rustai is passionate about sharing Iranian culture and traditions through food and storytelling. His mission now is to spread awareness of Iranian culture and cuisine, which he does by writing his blog, teaching online cooking classes, and through his work with the nonprofit organization, Seattle Esfahan Sister Cities Advocacy. In 2020, Farhang Foundation was extremely proud to welcome him to our Farhang Flavor web series with two mouth-watering hit episodes. You may follow Mr. Rustai on his popular Instagram profile, The Caspian Chef. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Armita Hosseini and Omid Rustai to today's talk. Hi, Armita John. Hi, Omid John. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon. I, from wherever you are, Toronto is afternoon. So thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I will now step back and let you take over from here. I'm looking forward to this talk. Wonderful. Thank you. Before we start, I really would like to thank the Farhang Foundation for really creating these beautiful opportunities for people like my friend and colleague Armita and I to, to join you and share part of our knowledge and expertise and passion with you. And more specifically, I'd like to thank Ali Rizzo for being always, always such a big supporter of our work. So today, uh, what we're really wanting to do is talk a little bit about role of food in Persian cuisine. Um, and Iranian cuisine. So as you know, with most cultures, food plays a significant role, um, much like it does in Iranian culture. It's usually a ritual of coming together, uh, not only on a day-to-day -day basis, but also it, it has such a deep sense of connection with our holidays and ceremonies. What we hope to achieve in this conversation today is just to begin scratching the surface a little bit and begin talking about some of these norms, expectations, 
and issues and challenges that are associated with food and eating and also some of the cultural norms and expectations. As you would imagine, food and eating can not only be incredibly enriching in community building, but it can also be a source of distress, pain and suffering. Our hope today is that we can walk away with some specific tools and tips related to healthy and mindful eating and improving our relationship with and through food while incorporating some of these influences, uh, particularly during these challenging pandemic times. With that being said, uh, please to keep in mind that this talk is not intended to provide any specific therapeutic advice or address any specific issues, especially related to disordered eating. Um, we want to cover quite a bit of material, the relationship with food, some of the psychological nuances that are associated with our eating experiences, as well as mindful eating. And perhaps, Omijan, a good place that you and I can start is to look at the role of food in our families and Iranian culture. I know when I think about culture, it's this umbrella, right? There is this Iranian culture, customs, certain rituals that drive that. And then we have the culture of the family that's within that big umbrella, that it shapes our practices, um, that food shapes that home environment. So. Maybe we'll start with you sharing some of your ideas about the psychology and relationship of food, and we'll go from there. Absolutely. Brilliant. So I think um, it will be really significant and important to start with the obvious, and that is food and cooking. There is always gender-specific roles and responsibilities associated with it, though none of this is black and white, all or nothing stereotypically and historically rather speaking, the role, responsibility, and often the burden of cooking has fallen on our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunts, and, and women in our family. Um, how that showed up in my family, it would, it would mean that my mom would uh, spend the time in the kitchen preparing the food while my dad would be more specifically responsible for gathering the ingredients and bringing it. And what, I'm, what we're, we want to name that and to acknowledge that, and then also try to hope maybe to create a mindset around how do we balance that uh, so that not everybody enjoys cooking. I mean, let's face it, nor everybody's good at cooking. So it doesn't mean if you don't enjoy it or if you're good at cooking that you can't take roles and responsibilities in the kitchen. So we wanted to just name that and at least help you know folks like if you don't enjoy cooking, you know, how might you contribute in setting up the, the table or how might you take responsibility and accountability for either shopping or cleaning up, right? I think that's, that gender role is shifted just a bit, but I think to the, to a great degree, that's still, that's, that um, responsibility do, does fall on, on, our, on the women in our family. So I wanted to kind of name that a little bit and then move toward a little bit more about um, kind of what happens at the dinner table, right? Are we having enjoyable, pleasant conversations? Are we sharing through our experiences of the day or is the dinner table a silent place or is it a place to discuss and manage and address conflict? So obviously we're an advocate for eating time to be more peaceful so that it can evoke more joyful experiences, so that it evokes more pleasant emotions, so that our digestive system is working, uh, collaborating with our emotions and making the experience more pleasant and enjoyable. And, you know, we can also talk about, or we rather need to talk about our preferences around food. Our palates are so different. Not everybody likes the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, how, how, how does your family manage likes and dislikes? Like are, are you encouraged to eat something new? Are you encouraged to try something new? Or is there a power dynamic that, that sometimes shows up? And that's a really, really tricky one. That, you know, if, if, we, if we were to go down too deep into the clinical part of it, which we won't, but to, to really walk around this tenderly to make sure 
how likes and dislikes are being managed doesn't become about power control and, and it could certainly lead to more problematic and uh, disorderly eating. So one of the things I always tell my parents, uh, rather the parents that come to counseling, my clients as, as parents, um, you know, I always tell them like it is part of your job to model healthy eating. You fill the house with fruits and vegetables and such and you present them. It is your responsibility to model it. It is your child's prerogative to try it, like it or dislike it. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that a new flavor needs to be introduced to a child's palate about 18 times before they say, okay, it's not as bad as I, I thought it was once uh, or I thought it would be. So it's important to just kind of uh, identify how we manage the likes and dislikes. So I'll tell a quick little story and then I'll pass it on to Armita. Um, as a child, this child, um, I didn't like eggplant and I was blessed or cursed, depending on your perspective, to grow in a culture that adores eggplants. And we have so many braises and stews and, and frittata cuckoo style dishes. So what I would have then to do, you know, when I didn't like eggplant so much, I had to work around it. But the funny thing is that every once in a while, I would make such a good case to my parents that they would feel sorry for me and they'll let me eat hot dogs instead <laughs> of eggplant. So to this day, I have such a strange association of hot dogs and eggplants. Now, as a, <laughs> as a grown man, I adore eggplants and I can't get enough of it. So what what how do you how do you manage these in your home armita um you know funny enough there are certain foods that as an adult i don't like because yeah. i haven't had a good experience i've been you know force fed uh when i was a kid and you know i think force feeding is managing likes and dislikes is, a, is an interesting topic because in our culture specifically, force feeding is a sign of love. You show love through food. You know, you, you force your kids to eat a certain way or eat certain things. And as you said, not everybody likes every food. And I think about this from a developmental perspective because I work with kids and I work with adolescents. The practice of force feeding, for example, was a big one in my family. I remember I was being chased around the table to the point where my mom wanted to feed me because she was worried I, I'm not gonna grow or I'm not gonna have nutritious food. So even though it's a way of sharing love, force feeding, the parent makes an assumption that the children does or the child doesn't know instinctively when or how much to eat. And the truth is biologically, we're all wired and programmed that we know exactly when and how much to eat to survive. So I think um, looking at it from a little bit of a psychology clinical lens, because force feeding is such a big thing in our culture, in most cases, again, if it's done once in a while, it's different, but if it's done consecutively and all the time, it can be a trigger. It can evoke a lot of negative emotions. For example, when you, um, a very popular one was, well, you didn't finish your food. Can you think of all the kids in Africa that are starving? You trigger a, an emotion and that's guilt. You're being a little bit of shame. You know, if you impose punishments, like I won't talk to you if you don't eat your food or you don't clean your plate, you're instilling a little bit of fear. So we have to be mindful of what type of consequences we put in and what kind of reactions that might trigger in our child as a parent, right? And I think another point that sometimes we unconsciously, we may not intend do as parents what we do is we teach our kids to ignore their body ignore their body signals so force feeding ultimately can lead to in teenage and, and adult years um, to these unhealthy food habits that we pick up right we start to ignore our internal cues and i know we're going to talk about mindful eating uh, soon these internal cues we ignore Right. Yeah. And that, that I think that's something that 
unfolds over time. Um, also, I don't think it makes it pleasant for anybody at the table because you're constantly having arguments and there's a lot of tension at the dinner table. So it makes the experience of eating food with family also a negative one. Right. right? What you, yeah, sorry. So like what you get to associate with food is that yes. tension, right? Yeah, it's a lot of it. It's counterproductive. So um, a few tips that I have that um, I can think of for especially parents is teaching your kids when to say no, thank you, that not everybody has to like the same food, being mindful and refraining from force, eat, force feeding your child, right? Um, you will sometimes discover that they have a lot to teach you about their awareness of their body. It's not to, um, and this specifically comes to how much you ask your child to eat. Again, certain things need to be monitored, like the type of food that eat, you eat in the household. You wanna try to promote eating healthy. Um, trying an experiment where for a couple of weeks, you control what um, and when your kids, your kids eat, but not how much they eat. That's a big one. So um, not snacking between, not snacking on healthy foods between main meals, planning activities around the main meal so that it increases your child's appetite. It's um, giving transitional and warning signs between meals. So you're kind of meal planning what the day is going to look like so that your kids can expect what they're eating. There are just you know, some tips around how to manage those expectation pieces. And sometimes it's not about um, necessarily what the kid likes or dislikes or how much they want to eat. I think sometimes it's about our own worries, our own insecurities, right? So we need to keep that in check. Right. I think this, this concept of mindful eating goes so hand in hand with mindful parenting. So mm -hmm. it is lot more involved than just feeding our kids but rather much like beautifully you presented as to what is the process around making sure the kid gets to trust their own instinct mm -hmm. while you of course monitor and you're present and you're active but you're not micromanaging it yeah, yeah. brilliant yeah. you know now that that wasn't entirely like much of my experience but this mm -hmm. idea of you got to finish what's on your plate mm -hmm. oh yes oh yes that I mean Right. But I mean, <laughs> right. You gotta you got you got your plate to be shiny, right? So finish it all off. I, that my dad would look at how many grains of rice I had left behind. And so mm -hmm. I would have to finish so there were no grains of rice on that mm -hmm. plate, right? Okay. Well done. Okay. Should we move on to the next yep. topic? Let me you. Yep. All right. So how we started this conversation is about the food and the way that it's so community oriented in many cuisines, but certainly in the Iranian cuisine. And so I think of, you know, in, in the Farsi word for it is sofre. Uh, sofre to translate it to English essentially just means a spread, but I don't think spread truly captures the essence of a sofre. Sofre to me had its front and center has community built in it. You don't make a spread for one person. You mm -hmm. make a spread and you invite family and friends and neighbors over. And these sofre, uh, these spreads are often associated with either secular holidays or religious holidays, uh, as well as weddings and you know New Year celebration. Like we just had uh, sofre Noruz, which was our Persian New Year. That I think part of the challenge during the pandemic is that we haven't been able to gather around these sofre, uh, these spreads. And that's been one of the more challenging ways where I think it affected our community because we do eat family style. Mm -hmm. We do within our community. And so, yes, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about it, like this idea of virtual get togethers isn't exactly the same yet it is significant and important because it is part of our DNA to, mm -hmm. to share this experience with one another. So that's been one of the elements that I think pandemic has been challenging for the Iranian community in the way that it impacted us. Mm -hmm. um, and 
is there anything that you wanted to add in here, Armita, or should I hop to the to the next step? Um, are you going to be diving into recipes? And... Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think, and my experience as as with many Iranians is very similar, which is Nowruz symbolizes community, right? A sense of belonging. And there's a lot of research that shows when there is a disconnect between a person and their heritage and their customs and their rituals and their relationships, it creates distress. And we see that now uh, more than ever because of COVID, because of that disconnection. Like I, I remember, I think the rituals that I practiced as a kid, being able to eat kuku sabzi and fish and read a verse of Hafiz, um, and share that with my grandparents, get that dollar bill, you know, as 80, all of these things that got passed on, they're wisdom, right? They're interactions that truly genuinely formed how I think about community, how I think about my own sense of identity, especially millennials and our kids and generation that is so uh, disconnected, unfortunately, with that sense of community building, activities that build communities because of social media, because of all these other activities that shift that, create isolation, and, and it's created different norms. So it's important to constantly reinforce that. I think one of the things that um, many different cultures do that is helpful is setting up these spreads and setting up your Christmas tree, all of these things way beforehand, you get yourself prepped, right? You relive those memories, you reaffirm your identity in a way, you build those relationships and connections, even if you're on your own, and it helps with that isolation. So teaching recipes, I think it does the same thing. It really anchors a person's identity. And it helps with stress and it helps with depression and anxiety. So, yes. Yeah. I, I think maybe you were watching over me this year as I was hustling and bustling to get my no ruse uh, half scene set up this year. Mm -hmm. Like this year, I started so much earlier than ever mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. Like, you know, I am older than you and so I've, I haven't been in Iran in 40 years and so there was a significant period of my life where, where my heritage and culture wasn't part of my day day to day living and, and now that I am indeed older and now mm -hmm. I am definitely that the sense of longing that sense of belonging that we talk about right because it, it reminds me where I where we come from and when I um sprout the sapze when I go chasing after you know whatever item on yeah. to go on the no ruse it's it's really just kind of reconnecting and the sentiments of nostalgia the sense of joy mm -hmm. a sense of you're not alone right mm -hmm. really all good yummy emotions yeah yeah it's it's a space to connect and uh that's why I think people say uh, there's again research to back this up they say if you want to go on vacation plan it ahead. Think the idea of thinking about your vacation brings you happiness. That excitement builds up. And it, it's the same concept with no rules, for example, putting out this spread and getting prepared. It excites you and it gives you a sense of connection. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So moving on with uh, getting more into nitty gritty with food and cooking. Mm -hmm. so it's fascinating how we learn to cook. And, you know, you and I, these days, we have access to books. I have a stack of Persian yeah. cookbooks here. They're, you know, open up the, uh, as I fondly call it, Uncle Google. And there is a bunch of recipes for anything and everything you want. Yeah. And so we're learning a little differently about our cuisine and traditions today, a little differently, particularly for those of us living in, outside of Iran. Yeah. Maybe we don't have access to all of our family or all the wisdom within the family. So back in the day, like my mother is the eldest of five sibling. 
Mm-hmm. She, she didn't learn cooking by, you know, looking through uh, internet. Certainly there wasn't any or cookbooks. She learned by being in the kitchen. She was yeah. expected to be, to be learning and she, her mother taught her and then she passed that on to her sisters. And, and to this day, she is my main source of, she's my personal Persian food Google. Like I just go and, and ask her, you know, how to do this thing. But there is that gap again, like there is recipes were, were taught down, passed down from generation to generation. And while some families are very generous with sharing of that recipes, some mm-hmm. families are very, they cherish. It's like a gem. Uh, it's like a cherished possession that they hold on to the recipes. And you will talk a little bit more about it, but it's just what purpose that serves for them mm-hmm. in terms of securing these recipes and not just making a book of it or making a blog out of it and and spreading it out. So there is that nuance between the older generation, how they learned passed down versus how we are learning these days. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I always have to reemphasize when it comes to food and cooking, I live in the US, Armita, you live in Canada. We live outside of Iran, our access to regional food in Iran is limited at best, right? And so I will, and I have to make substitutions and and adapt. And while many might not like the fact that I will put a little extra parsley instead of a very specific regional herb from north of Iran, I have to work with what I have, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's another element of the cuisine that is having to shift and change living outside of Iran. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think even you inside Iran, each family has a different variation of, let's say, formasapsi, right? So, and there's a resistance to that. You're right. There is this sense of things have been the way they have been and changing it is a big deal. And, and change is hard. I think change is hard for people, but we hold those recipes, as you said, the traditional ways of making them quite sacred. Um, and I think that sometimes can get in the way of creativity. Maybe you want to make your warm massage and use a different type of bean, right? Um, so my when I think about what you just said, which is people hold certain recipes as as secretive or so it's so cherished I think that for example my grandma's role in the family was to pass down wisdom was to um, serve us food if you want a comfort food she was the place to go so it gave her a sense of relevance it was her way of connecting with family members one of the ways right so maybe holding on and cherishing those family recipes is her way of staying relevant. It's her way of staying connected in a way, you know? That's so brilliant. Yes, so true. So. Okay. Yeah. Is, um, is your grandmother willing to share her warm sabzi recipe with the rest of, oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 All I know is that you, you, you just got to let it slow cook for hours. That, that was the secret. So she didn't or, share much other than or, that. Or, or almost blackening. The, yeah, the- yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Okay, we're going to transition on to, I think, the biggest topic of our conversation, which is this concept of what we're calling intuitive cooking and mindful eating. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there are big words here. I think we've all heard a version of it and it could mean different things to different people. But ultimately, you know, where I like to start with this concept of intuitive cooking, it actually has existed in our culture for centuries, you know, in much like other ancient cuisines like Chinese herbal medicine or Ayurvedic style of cooking, Iranians have their own version. And we in Farsi, we refer to it as Garmi and Sardi, Garmi being warming, Sardi being cooling. It's ultimately a, a, a philosophy, a way of seeing food and our own composition and temperament that respond to cooling food and heating food. Not that it's about the temperature necessarily, but it's about the 
uh, what the word that I use sometimes to describe is like the energetics of the food mm-hmm. that in, that cools your body down or warms you up depending on what what your composition needs. When I think of the whole concept of gami and sardi, I, it, it brings me comfort because it's a structure. It's it's it allows me to function within an existed. Um, uh, wisdom, ancient wisdom that is designed to take care of my body. Now, whether I practice it religiously and I put it to work, like I would never eat a fess in June in summer, I know that's not always true, right? But at least it offers me some guidelines. And these guidelines comforts us. We all, as much as we like to improvise, having some structure is actually quite grounding and comforting. And that's one thing that it just brings great sense of mental um um what's the word i'm thinking of like it comforts us it it orients us around yeah yeah so if there is an intuitive cooking process well there has to be something that matches and pairs with it as an as a mindful eating Mm -hmm. and mindful eating maybe again there's it's a terminology that we've all been exposed to and but what is it right and what do you expect it for it for it to be or to do for you and and so i don't want to imply that it's this convoluted and complicated rituals and systems but it's about an extension of mindfulness it's the idea of above all how hungry are you when you arrive at the table are you at a level 10 hungry or are you a level one hungry does that determine um, how much you will eat. And then much like we were talking about earlier, the whole satiety signal. When do you know you have consumed enough food that your brain is registering the fact that you have uh, nourished yourself? Yeah. So it starts with how hungry you are, how fast and how, how, eat, how slow you eat and how full you get post eating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I think the nuance of Persian uh, element that that plays a part here, and that is the the word that we use in Farsi is tarof. Tarof, I you know, it's always hard to describe it in English. Like all Iranians know what tarof is, and non-Iranians, I sometimes describe it as kind of like this elaborate system of hospitality, right? Mm-hmm. I think maybe <laughs> all, right, and so. Tarof could interfere, right? Tarof, when it comes to food and eating, though it is utterly charming and polite and part of the endearing aspects of our culture, but it can also really interfere. I, I specifically think of a, of a neighbor we had in Iran, like it was tarof to the point of stomach discomfort and pain mm-hmm. and to eat what was not only on your plate, but that you were served again and again and again. So that these are the kind of things that, while they are charming and endearing, as parents, as in, in our families, we need to be really mindful and aware of how that shows up and could interfere with mindful eating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, the, and Armita, John, you will go into a little bit more detail. I will just kind of name a couple of the, you know, how I choose to be mindful when I eat. I think of... I go a couple of different ways. I look at it with what's right in front of me and then I go meta with it. Like what's in front of me is, is it orange? Is it yellow? Is it smooth? Is it textured? Is it fluid? So I, I, I get curious about the item that is on my plate. Mm-hmm. Um, the curiosity about the food, right, is, is actually allows us to slow down and to be intentional about what it is that we're eating. Mm-hmm. And then when I say I go meta, I think of this red pepper. I mean, where does it come from? Mm-hmm. Sometimes I look at the label and it's like, oh my God, this is from Australia. This is from Israel. This is from Mexico. Um, okay, maybe not good, not, not bad, but that awareness of mm-hmm. where the food has traveled, what conditions does it require? Does it require sun? Does it require rain? Can I also validate and acknowledge the farmer? the rain, the sunshine, all the elements, the person that picked it, the person, you know, one of my running jokes is that every, every neighborhood I move to, the first thing I do is I get to know the produce man at, the, at my grocery store because I want to have a relationship with the produce man. Mm-hmm. And, 
And so as I look at this mindful eating, I'm thinking of my friend at the produce aisle that, uh, that uh, placed them so beautifully and that it becomes part of my ritual of mindful eating. So these are the kind of things I look for and how I describe mindful eating. And Armita, you will go into a little bit more, quite a bit more detail on this. Piece. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's so interesting you talk about tarot. I think we have certain customs that, um, as you said, are beautiful things to see. You, I, I think of tarot as a curse and a blessing. It's a blessing because it shows how hospitable and generous and respectful and kind we are as people. Um, it's a curse uh, because even though it's a beautiful thing to see, it's, a, it's really a cultural phenomenon that uh, is so unique to us because people go above and beyond of what they have. I've gone traveled to Iran and people go above and beyond of, to share things they don't have enough of or spend money on uh, things they don't have for their guests, right? And it creates obligation. But as you said, sitting at a table, you are again someone taught of and taught of and taught of. You end up eating much more that you can handle. You're eating out of guilt and obligation and not pleasure. So it's really important to think about what are certain customs in our families, in our culture as a whole that get in the way of mindful eating. And I, you touched on what mindful eating is. It's really a framework um, to make healthier food choices that might potentially lead to weight loss. The goal is not for it to lead to weight loss because every time you choose foods based on a certain outcome, we're not mindful eating because we're eating with a means to an end. Yeah. And there is no calorie counting or specific strategies. We're trying to be aware of our relationship with food. You know, our mind is calm and content and clear with when we're with what we're eating and when we're eating. Um, and everybody slips up. I slip up, you slip up, everybody slips up. And mindful eating helps us to be less judgmental, less emotional, less critical about our choices if you slip up. So it's really changing your thinking about food. And a few tips that I have, I think it starts with our grocery shopping list. Avoiding impulse shopping, especially when you're hungry. The number of times I've been starving and I have gone to Costco, oh my God, it's, it's, <laughs> it's up really badly. So avoiding you know, processed food aisles and uh, sticking to the produce sections, Again, you touched on that, engaging your senses, curious about the texture and the color, uh, putting your fork down when you're eating, getting curious about your food, not being on autopilot mode when you're chewing down a meal. One thing I sometimes do is if it takes me 15, 20 minutes to eat, I spend a few minutes, up to five minutes of mindful eating. So really paying attention to the texture, the color of my food, how it actually tastes, and it helps me slow down. That five minutes, I notice that I en end up enjoying food more than the remaining of my meal because I'm really focused on what that food tastes like, what it looks like. The other one is interruptions. So getting rid of distractions, cell phones, screens, TV, we're all guilty of that. Sitting uninterruptedly with your food and your company to really reconnect your senses. And we're going to talk about senses and some of the psychological processes that are involved in that. So um, all in all, managing these little things um, knowing that you have enough of an appetite to eat, for example, because our brain and bodies are so connected and it's set up in a way that if you are really star starving and you're eating faster and a faster rate, your body can't register. It registers and sends signals to your brain when it's full, but you're eating at a faster pace and it can do that. So last tip I have is, a little bit of self-reflection. So what triggers my eating? Asking why am I eating? Am I eating because I want to nourish my body 
or am I eating right now because I want to fill in my emotional hunger? Because a lot of us, especially during the pandemic, I think that's been such a big problem that you eat because you're sad, you eat because you're anxious. Right. So managing that, tracking that, yeah. that would be a, a big piece, I think. Yeah, and, and boredom, right? Where yeah. we're not coming and going as much as, you know, so we're hanging around the house and, and eating uh, out of boredom, right? Yeah. 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 Um, as you were talking, Armita, this one other item that came up to, to my thinking was how often we qualify food as good food, bad food, mm. and how that also deeply interferes with the whole idea of mindful eating. Like food up by itself doesn't have value judgment. It's our relationship with food that then determines it, whether it's a good food or a bad food. Ice cream inherently isn't good or bad. Potato chips isn't inherently good and bad. So being aware of what we qualify mentally Mm -hmm. as good food, bad food. So it, we, much like what you said earlier, like we create an expectation. If I eat good food, then I, then I should lose weight or that I should look a certain way. Or if I'm eating bad food, the whole shame inducing, mm -hmm. scarcity thinking around mm -hmm. secrecy of it or, or just feeling bad about consuming something that then you'd have to in some way repent for it for yeah. having had bad food. So really mindful of, what we're qualifying as good or bad as there really isn't, right? Eat mm -hmm. whole food, that's good food, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else before we move to the no. next one? No, I think we covered that. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to transition to talking a little bit about cooking and enjoyment and the design and art form and all of these things that, you know, it's bringing smiles uh, to to our faces. So I cooking is a very sensual experience. It evokes senses. So while we know that, how can we actually um, add on to these <coughs> experiences of, excuse me, <coughs> to, to further enhance our um, senses? So for example, um, you know, when I'm cooking, I might put on music or when I'm eating, I might put on a music that evokes uh, feelings for me, or I may use uh, specific plates. I may use specific uh, traditional cookware. Like here I am, you've noticed that I'm sipping tea from my very Persian estekan. That it, right? I'm smiling as I pick it up and I proudly show it. Yeah. Because it evokes these sweet and endearing feeling. This cup reminds me of who I am and where I come from mm -hmm. and how I am much like you, how I am much like all the folks that are amongst us. And that feeling of belonging, like this, this idea of the emotions that get cultivated and created are all part of our prefrontal cortex and part of our executive functioning. And the more we can activate these things, right? then the less we're trapped into our primitive, what I call lizard brain, amygdala, where we get caught into the fight and flight, good, bad, right, wrong, hurry, rush. So play the music, choose a, 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 pleasure, a pleasing set of platters and plates and um, silverwares that, that evoke that sense of multitude of uh, sensual experiences along with the food and eating. So um, I have, I'll say this one thing and then I'll move on. I have this in Farsi, we say kafkir. It's a um, spatula. It's a copper spatula that my mother brought from me, uh, for me one of her last trips that she had made to Iran. I just love it. I, I just love using it. And so lately I'm using it in my food photography. I've had a few people offering me money <laughs> To buy it from me, <laughs> and I'm. It's. <clears throat> I don't know how much it's worth, but it is absolutely precious because, listen, I'm. I'm sitting here talking about this kafki because it's that precious. Yeah. So a simple tool could create that sense of joy. Mm. And I'll have Armita go a little again deeper with the deeper aspects of the Persian art and and literature and all that that gets combined with our uh, sense of food and eating. 
Yeah, yeah, uh, you said it. So I think I think about food and eating as much of a psychological activity as it is a physical activity. Because as you said, the prefrontal cortex and the parts of our brain that are associated with emotions get triggered when we look at food, when we hear music as we're eating. For example, um, you know, really high pitched, high tempo, loud music can make you eat, eat faster but it dulls the taste of food. So that's why you, you'll see certain colors, like bright colors, like red, they can increase hunger. And I'm, I'm always interested about the marketing side of that. Um, that's why you see a lot of uh, fast food restaurants using colors yellow and red, because you're you know faster, quicker turnaround. So they know how to manipulate our senses to get us to eat a certain way. So we can create the same environment at home, as you said, a calming music or a music that is nostalgic and it increases our pleasure as we're eating. Um, I'm fascinated with the art of cooking. I think creativity is our secret weapon for better mental health. When pandemic started, I think you must have been busy. We've been really busy because a lot of people were in distress. And my way to de-stress was food and, and creativity. So essentially it's the same effect as doing mindfulness. It really calms the mind. It's an antidepressant. It's a natural antidepressant. And what sets our culture apart from many other countries is how preserved arts and literature and music is in it. It's really the core part of it, right? Art is reflected on our spreads, on Sofre. We get together, we're inspired by all of these inspirations and all of these arts and, and crafts. And we see creativity as, it, as in its rarest form, in my opinion. Uh, we have this saying, did I say it correctly, I think? Right, so um, we're so inspired by it. And I think, as you said, using decorative tools, our ki handmade kitchenware, beautiful termes and our handmade you know, tablecloth, all of these things um, make our spaces beautiful, are a creative outlet, bring pleasure to a table. Whenever I want to feel good, sometimes I use you know, the antiques or as you said, the passed down um, Tupperware and things that my mom gave me. And it just, it, it just makes the experience of eating so much better for me, right? Um, so all of these are part of intent, intention to heighten our senses. It's valuable to incorporate all of these intentions in our eating rituals because eating is such a ritualistic part of our life. We, we eat three times a day. It's a big component and it doesn't just start with preparation and cooking. It's from grocery shopping all the way to when you finish your meal. That is an entire process that we need to pay attention to and be intentional. Right. Well said, well said. So I think we're gonna move on to our final um, uh, topic that we're going to discuss today. And that is, all right, it's pandemic. Some parts of the world is improving. Some part of the world is still working their way through this terrible uh, ordeal. And so it's impacting all of us in similar ways and in very different ways. So what I wanted to just kind of leave this conversation with um, you know, there are folks that live by themselves and they're disconnected from their friends and family and community. Yet given how integrated communal eating is in our Persian culture, how do we make sure that folks that are on their own also have this opportunity to sustain and, and maintain that sense of connection and that belonging? So I know we're spending a lot of time on screens and we're all working from Zoom in one form way or another. And I sure will be the last person that want to hop on, on Zoom again, but there are, how do we make this a special occasion where you prioritize sharing a meal with a friend on, on screen? So you maybe you, you know, I'm cooking with a friend in Switzerland soon that we're just gonna cook together, right? Um, 
it's a way of using what's accessible and available. It's the technology that is available to make it a special occasion. Mm. Sometimes, you know, folks that live by themselves, they're, um, they have a hard time like preparing a, a feast for themselves. And I say, all right, maybe it doesn't make sense to do a feast every night, but how about a special occasion where you design, you plan, and maybe you share the experience, or maybe it is entirely for the sake of self that is you celebrate yourself by having a special meal. Mm -hmm. The last thing I would say on this piece is um, um, maybe, maybe if, if act of nightly cooking is too much, is too much work, too much effort, how about uh, maybe devoting a special day, let's say Saturday or Sunday, that you devote maybe two, three, four, five hours, that you cook a whole lot of food. So I used to work a long ago as a personal chef. So then you can be your own personal chef. You cook a whole lot of food and, and then you pack your refrigerator with prepared food, homemade prepared food, that then you get to celebrate the fact that you didn't have to make it every night. So these are just kind of like some of the simple things. And, and I love what you said, Armita John, if your eating takes 15 minutes, take five minutes to, to, to reinforce the mindful eating. It really does make such a significant difference about our relationship with food. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll also add a few other tips. I know we're short for time, um, specifically to families and eating with your kids. Because I know making food in the kitchen can be chaotic. So why not use that time? Why not use cooking and food as a means of an activity that would actually be an entertainment for your family? For example, um, creating a binder of family recipes that you can cook every week, or uh, kids could be the chefs in the kitchen and make meals for the parents or create some sort of an activity or competition around that, because kids are always told what to do all day and night, kids and teens. So this would be a chance for them to be empowered, to have a sense of agency, to take control and, and do something and use their creativity. Right. So we're switching roles in a, in a, in a way. Um, and all of these could be positive experiences to build healthy, strong connections and bonds with families through food. Um, lastly, you know, for couples, not forgetting to play. We encourage play in kids and we grow up and we forget about it as an adult. So thinking outside of, uh, of the box, you can take turns in creating a special meal. It could be, you know, pretending, have a date night, pretend like you're in a restaurant. So really thinking outside of the box, I think imagination is our tool, especially in a time where we're so confined in, in small spaces stuck indoor, the only way that we can, um, you know, experience things is through our imagination, through our sense of creativity. So supporting small businesses, for example, you don't feel like cooking, get a gift card, buy a gift card from a local restaurant and send it to your friends and then set up a, a date night or set up a um, I know we're running out of time, so there's there's a plenty of material to cover, but we'll cut it there. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. This was so interesting and informative. And, you know, well, one thing I took away from this was that mindful eating, that when you're eating a meal to really pay attention to the food, because we're all so busy running around that we don't even pay attention to what we're shoving down or you know in our mouth and don't even appreciate it we have a lot of questions uh, and very little time but i want to just touch base on some of the questions we got one of the biggest questions we got over and over again is basically why do you think iranian food is so underrepresented internationally as compared to you know other cultures like japanese thai turkish chinese um what is your thoughts about that well i maybe i'll I'll say the unpopular thought here, like I think the politics have really uh, influenced the accessibility and availability of Persian cuisine. Um, 
And I think one of the things, one of the conversations that is happening a lot is that a lot of our Iranian restaurants are geared and designed to serve Iranians. They are not um, necessarily set up or oriented to offer food to someone who's not familiar with Iranian cuisine. So you and I could sit down at a cello kebab and go to town and eat it all and maybe ask for extra rice. Whereas maybe my American friend or my non-American friend, you know, uh, they, they're not accustomed to that amount of meat or that amount of rice for that matter. So I think these are elements that have been preventative from that crossing over. But with that said, I mean, look at, the, here's the two of us, the three of us sitting here and talking about it. And I think there is a shift, but I, sadly, I think that the change takes time. So that's my thought. Yeah. I, a very similar response. I think some intergenerational oppressions and our political climate definitely doesn't put us on the map. So I'll just, I'll stop there if, if people have additional questions. Yeah, great. Uh, I think those are great answers. Uh, another question we had was uh, um, for each of you, what is your favorite uh, dish, Iranian dish? That you have connected uh, great memories with, uh, which you go to when you want to boost some positive feelings. Oh. That's a tough one. Kaime Badem Jun is mine. Um, I have my mom makes really good Kaime Badem Jun, so I, I, for me, it's nostalgic. It just brings so much comfort. Um, ironically, I am making Kaime Badem Jun tonight. <laughs> I have guests coming over. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not making this up. I am making it. Um, my favorite, um, I, I think the thing that just brings me smile is cake Yazdi. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know it's not a dish here, but like there's just such fondness uh, about these delicate little cupcakes. Like who doesn't love a good delicate cupcakes, right? So that to me is, I think of it and it evokes a wide range of emotions. But if I was to go with a stew, uh, I think Orma Sabzi, much like many Iranians, we yeah. love our Orma Sabzi, get those herbs cooked properly yeah. and uh, add on to, you know, whatever choice of protein you add on to it. Great. Uh, another question that we got a lot of uh, or touched on is that, do you have any tips for reversing effects of force feeding or uh, tarof after uh, you grow up? Um, how we product, how we as products of force feeding can learn to recognize our body's signals. Oh, <laughs> I that I'll say this. I think that crosses into a little bit of therapy work because it's about boundary setting. <laughs> and and I appreciate when I work with my Iranian clients, it's it's always difficult to say, you know, you got to set boundaries with your Persian mother. It's a little. It's difficult, right? But it but it starts with you got to name it. It can't be implicit anymore. It has to be named out. That it's okay. It's cherished, but it is also better to to take ownership of your own dietary needs and satiety needs. So that's where I would go with it. Yeah, that I agree. I think learning to say respectfully, you know, no, thank you. And I know that you're showing love and I know that's the intention, but it's going to make me feel uncomfortable. It's going to bring stomach ache, just kind of naming the consequence of what that behavior is going to be. I, I said, I don't like certain foods because I've been force fed. So now that I look back, I kind of reflect on that. Why do I not like this food? It's because it's been force fed. So can I change that relationship now with myself? Right. So it's again naming and recognizing and labeling how come that is for me and being you become mindful of then that with your interactions with other people as well, your kids and your parents and such. Those are great tips. By the way, uh, Professor Hamid Nahvisi, once in one of his lectures he's at Northwestern University, his uh, description of Tarof in English is virtual courtesy, which I thought was such a great term to kind of nail. <laughs> nailed that tarof because it's always so difficult to explain what tarof means um so i thought that was you guys touched base on tarof. So. 
Um, I'll end with this last comment we got uh, from someone. Uh, they said, we love following you both on Instagram and applaud you on how you present food um, uh, and what inspired you to get into this field of food, I guess. Yeah. Do you want to go, Armita John, first? You go first. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll steal part of your answer. Um, you can. I think mine will be a little different. Um, I am making up for lost time. Um, I have such a gap in my connection with Iran and to my roots. And so I find it, I was having this conversation with a therapist friend yesterday. I find it ironic, like I am now the person who is introducing Persian food and mothers are, you know, and fathers are, you know, messaging me and thanking me for how I'm preserving the Persian. And I just think, oh my, if you only knew how absent I was, so I'm making up for, you know, I am kind of uh, compensating for all the years that I felt so disconnected. And now I cook food and eat more rice than I've eaten in the past 30 years. Uh, <laughs> because, because it reminds me again of where mm -hmm. I come from and who I am. Mm -hmm. so I do it with that passion. Yeah. I think for me uh, is also, I have a large part of my family living outside of Iran. So I miss them and, and food becomes this mediator that connects me. And um, I come from a very creative family. My mom is extremely creative and that's something that we've always been taught. So when I create something or when I make a dish and I put a creative spin on that, it just brings feelings of comfort and home and it really stimulates me. And it's escape from my day job because psychology can be quite stressful, especially right now. It's just mentally draining, even though it's rewarding, it's mentally draining. So it really takes me away from that space. So. Well, on that note, I want to thank you both. We got many, many, many questions and people thanking you for this uh, very informative talk, something that we don't usually really, uh, in our Iranian culture, we don't touch on much. Um, and that's, I think, part of the whole taro. Uh, but uh, it was very informative. And I thank you for both taking the time to be with us on this latest edition of Fahang Connect. And I thank all the individuals who joined us. Uh, from all over the world to uh, attend this talk. If you missed any part of the talk, we will be posting the full recording of the talk on uh, fanhang.org as well as on all of Fanhang's social media platforms. And uh, we hope you have a great rest of your weekend and uh, we'll see you next time. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Spesalamati. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>